Welcome to part two with Dr. Susan Black, Acts chapter 16 through 21. And so then you get by verse nine, Paul has a vision in the night. So here we go again. But in the vision, he's told, be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace. In other words, don't give up, Paul. You know, you thought, hey, I'm done with you guys. And now it's like, hey, maybe you could look at family, you know, where you go, okay, kids, what could I have done more? (laughs) I'm now shaking my raiment at you. I'm I'm clean from henceforth. You know, I'm going to go to somebody else. But you go, wow, the Lord's not through with the Jewish people. The Lord's not through with your family, your children. And it's be not afraid. Continue to speak. Hold not thy peace. In other words, Paul, you know who you are. And I'm working with these guys, too, as I work with you. And the Lord's not upset with him. It's not like, Paul, why do you get so angry? Or why do you get so frustrated? He yeah, says, don't, don't have it. a meltdown. I get it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get it, Paul. You're frustrated. Don't be afraid. That's a great, the Lord stepping in and, and kind of calming the situation, <laughs> saying, it's okay. And notice the next verse, verse 10 in chapter 18, for I am with thee. How would you like to hear that? You're out there as a missionary, you're frustrated, you've tried your best, or even as a parent, and the Lord's saying, hey, I'm with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. And then he's told, hey, guess what, Paul? I got a lot of people in this city that want to hear from you. Don't be discouraged, you know, uh, just get out there. And although he ultimately is going to be accused of wrongdoing, even taken again to a Roman official, he's going to continue. You know, sometimes when you get, oh, like that personal revelation where you're so confident the Lord is with you and that there are many people in the city, it's like, don't give up, keep going. That then in Corinth becomes the end of his second journey, his second mission. He's done a pretty great mission, don't you think? (laughs) Isn't Luke interesting where he just covers a year and a half in one verse? (laughs) And he was there uh, 18 months teaching the word of God. And you're like, what happened? Yeah. Then we move on to his third mission. So this is then the longest one, perhaps three to four years. He's going to journey that 3,500 miles. (laughs) He's going to visit congregations he's been to before. That's kind of his mode of operation. He goes, wherever I've been, I'm coming back. I want to, you know, and so it's kind of like you wonder the missionaries, do they just come home and forget? Where do they keep in contact? Do they make an effort to remember those they've shared the gospel with? And I think Paul really sets the example that on each of his journeys, he's heading back to the same places to make sure, hey, everybody still got this. You know what I know. Christ is resurrected. (laughs) He's writing to them as well. Yes, he's writing to them. And we think that on this third mission is when perhaps he writes Romans, he writes 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and perhaps other epistles. But on the third mission, if you were to say, where does he stay the longest? And some historians will say he stays the longest in Ephesus. Some say even three years. Uh, you'd go, can I get a transfer? (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Three years. (laughs) Yeah, You're going to be there, Paul, for for three years. It's then in Ephesus as we move to chapter 19. He finds people not only prepared for the gospel, but remember how the Jewish people have spread all over. Well, uh, some of those who were baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist, right? who had not known Christ, and uh, he, he then finds a pocket of them. Notice in Ephesus, we're not seeing him going into the synagogues. <laughs> and you'd say, oh, for sure, this great city, there had to be synagogues. Well, he's got a new plan. I'm going <laughs> to visit everybody else now. I've seen them. I find people. They've got John's baptism, and I'm going to teach him about Christ, and I'm going to rebaptize him. And I'm going to give him the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then you start to see all kinds of miracles that come from Paul on this occasion while he's in Ephesus. You get he casts out demons. Perhaps he even organizes additional missionary activity. 
but I think one of the great was he's saying, hey, so you have sick among you. I've got handkerchiefs or aprons. Uh, you take it, have them touch it, whatever it is, and the diseases will depart from them, verse 12. And even evil spirits are going out. You'd say such is the faith and power of Paul. Yeah. Isn't there a story from church history? Wilford Woodruff. Okay. Uh, July 22nd, 1839. It's always called the Great Day of Healing. And Joseph has healed those in his household, his house by that point, almost like a hospital as he and Emma and family have moved into a tent in their front yard. And Joseph walks along what we call Water Street today in Nauvoo and then crosses over the Mississippi River to a small town in Montrose, Iowa. He's healing all the great, Elijah Fordham and others. And a, a man comes to him that has two twin children that are about five months old. And he claims that his children are lying sick. They're nigh unto death. And they're about two miles away from Montrose. And the prophet Joseph thinks he'll go. And then he says, no, he goes, uh, I'm not going to go. He says, I'll send a man to go with you to heal your children. Joseph will take out of his pocket a red silk handkerchief and give it to Wilford Woodruff. And Wilford said, Joseph told me to wipe their faces with the handkerchief when I administered to them and they should be healed. I went with the man and did as the prophet commanded me, and the children were healed. Perhaps much like the time of Paul in Ephesus, we have a more modern account of, of healing. Yeah. So Paul comes into Ephesus, and it sounds like this Apollos, this other missionary, had come in preaching John's baptism, but had not taught them about Christ. And Paul's like, well... <laughs> Until what were you baptized? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to have both parts here. And then with, with all this special miracles, it says in verse 11 with the handkerchiefs and being people being healed from disease, is Ephesus going to kind of blow up with converts? I think enough so that it's going to come to the attention of at least Demetrius and other silversmiths that become very, very concerned about their craft. Because in Ephesus, they have one of the seven wonders of the world, and it's the temple to Artemis, which is also called a temple to Diana, right? Suddenly, they're, they're making these little artifacts that John was talking about, you know, artifacts out of hands where people could almost like take their little temples into their own houses and then worship and feel like God had come to them, right? Yeah. Paul is bad for business, sounds like. Yes, mm -hmm. Paul is bad for business, his message. <laughs> so, <laughs> In verse 19, Susan, it sounds like he, he teaches this group of people who then get rid of all of their books. Many of them, which used curious arts, brought their books together, burned them before all men and counted the price of them. It was 50,000 pieces of silver. I mean, that's, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, John, you know this stuff more than I do, but I, that's, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of their old life that they're giving up for the gospel. And I didn't want to miss that verse that they're, who is it, John, in the Book of Mormon? I will give up all of my kingdom. King Lamoni's father, give away all my sins to know thee. It's a beautiful verse. So Demetrius starts on verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which had made silver shrines for Diana. <laughs> That's what John's talking about. But no small gain unto the craftsmen. So he calls together all these workers of like occupation. And he says, sir, you, you all know that why we're well-to-do is because of our craft. But now we've got a great problem. And it's one of the seven wonders of the world, this temple to the great goddess Diana, and suddenly it's starting to be despised. In other words, you're taking away our tourism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's converting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Everybody's mm -hmm. converting. And what are we going to do with this wonder of the world? And it says, magnificent, should it be destroyed? And it says, whom all Asia and the world worshipped. When they heard these sayings, all these 
people of like craftsmanship, in other words, silversmiths, cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So uh, they had a theater there. I've actually spoken in the theater. They claimed they could seat 24,000 people. The townsfolk are gathering in, and in one voice, they repeat over and over again for two hours. Can you imagine? Great is Diana of the Ephesians saying it over. I can see saying, Hosanna, <laughs> you know, being something you'd want to repeat again, again, again. But great is two Diana. Two hours, yeah. Of the Ephesians, you think you'd get, you get hoarse, you know, it would seem very rote. Uh, I think you'd be saying, hey, mom, when can I go home? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I know what's coming next. <laughs> Finally, it will stop when a town clerk comes, pees the people saying, you men of Ephesus, hey, we know this, Diana's great, basically go home. And it appears that Paul wanted to address the crowd. I mean, wouldn't that be the ultimate place? But he was dissuaded by church members, government authorities, concerned for his safety. After this, Paul will travel through Greece and Macedonia, strengthening church members, and will begin to to take off. John, I know one of your favorite verses is in that Acts 19. Do you want to read verse 32 for us? (laughs) Yeah, I just feel like this sounds like our world. They all rush into this theater And some cried one thing and some another. The assembly was confused and the more part of them knew not wherefore they were come together. (laughs) What are we doing here? I don't know. There was a protest. I thought I'd come. What should we yell today? Okay. And I just felt like that kind of is a good description of our world right now. Some cry one thing, some another. Some just show up. Well, I heard there was a protest. I don't know why I'm here really. Yeah. And the biggest part of them have no idea. Yeah, no idea <laughs> what's going here. on. They just keep yelling <laughs> yeah. it, like you said, for two hours. And I think one of the things you mentioned was the fact that not only was it a, a local business, but people, I guess, made pilgrimages there. And you guys both know you've been to places. Every site, it seems, has a gift shop. <laughs> every you know? site has a gift shop, and we could probably buy. <laughs> Something pretty similar to what they were yeah. selling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not made of silver, though, but colored silver. Right? Yeah. Even today, you could go buy a statue of Diana or Artemis, and they still have the gift shops. And I think that phrase, being bad for business, when I was there, I thought, what? How is the gospel bad for business? I mean, my first thought was word of wisdom, but then I thought, you know, anything that is a substitute for God, is what we have to be aware of. So idolatry isn't the same in our day, but having other substitutes for God, things that are of prime importance in our life, boy, that's the, that's the danger. Yeah. This seems to be very parallel to what the early church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints experiences. They move into an area, no one really cares, they're just kind of these these odd ducks that are overdoing their own thing. But as soon as they get big enough to start impacting voting or impacting shops, then comes out the hatred. Correct. I mean, you see it time and time again. You'd say Carthage, Warsaw, you know, little towns that were look like they could boom. <laughs> but when the saints come in and like you say, it starts out first welcoming but then they become a threat economically, politically. The saints need to move on. Yeah. And the same thing has happened in Paul. He has great success until it starts to hurt someone's business. And then there, there's a huge uproar of persecution. I just think it's wonderful that Paul had friends that were trying to protect him. And you can just imagine, Paul, I, I got to get in there. Look at all those people. I could, I could talk to him. No, you can't go in there. This could be really bad. And... <laughs> protect him from going into that theater. And it's huge right now. But from what I've heard, there's another layer of seats on top of what still remains. That you can't see. Yeah. So like you said, that's that's more than the Marriott Center of of people shouting the same thing for two hours. (laughs) And I like this town clerk of verse 35, where he says, everybody calm down. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody knows Ephesus worships 
Artemis, Diana, that's not going to change. So we're really getting ourselves into trouble here. Verse 40, we are in danger to be called into question for this uproar. There's no cause that we've done this. So if Demetrius has a problem, he can go to the law and work it out. Right. If our local autonomy gets out of hand, the Romans will come in and do something. That's what I understand. And so he's like, everybody, right. calm down. He's like a voice of reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's not a voice of faith. He's just a voice of reason to keep them safe. It reminds me of Alexander Donovan. Not a member, but mm-hmm. someone who says, let's work this out. Calm right. down. Everybody calm down. Gamaliel that we've talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. Gamaliel. Okay. Susan, are we ready for chapter 20? Chapter 20, you see Paul is on the move again. Finally, after probably three years or so in Ephesus, he's heading back to Macedonia or Greece, where he's going to stay three months. From there, he's ready to continue on to Syria He'll be kind of back and forth to Macedonia because he thought some of the Jews were plotting against him. Finally, he's talking about heading back to Jerusalem. But along the way, you see he stops, he visits, and he's seeing places where he'd been been before, even stops in Caesarea. But along the way, he gives talks. And the part that I thought was so funny and Perhaps (laughs) Perhaps <laughs> reminds me of some of my talks. Occurs in <laughs> verse 9. <laughs> so there's seated in a window a certain young man, right? He falls into this deep sleep. And why has he fallen into sleep? Is because Paul was preaching so long that he, <laughs> he sank down with sleep. And eventually he falls from the third loft and is taken up dead. I think that's so funny. Have you ever had somebody fall asleep when you were just kind of at the apex of this important topic you're trying <laughs> to great you know, shove down their throats, right? <laughs> they start snoring. That's <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, that's the worst. That's the worst. <laughs> so Paul went down, and then adding to his problems, he's already on the floor, and then it says, and Paul fell on him. <laughs> and you're like, wow, is he having a bad day or what? And, you know, he's listened to a long talk, although, Paul, I mean, maybe it's a message to all of us. There is a time limit. <laughs> Keep on that schedule. So the kid's fallen down. You know, he's taken to be dead. Paul goes down to see what's doing. He goes down from the perch where he was speaking, and then he falls on him. But then he embraces him and says, trouble not yourself, for his life is in him, and he does survive. I'm grateful that he survives, but um, comedy of errors, perhaps. Yeah, that that is a funny story. (laughs) I've always said you can make a great talk, a not-so-great talk, by going over your time. Yes, yes. (laughs) Time limit. (laughs) Yeah. Who was it that said that a great talk has a good beginning, a good ending, and very little in between? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so That's for great. all of us that have given one too many talks. Okay. So the story of the guy that fell out the window because the talk was boring, right? Or at least too <laughs> okay. long. As a historian, they always say that the reason that you became a historian was because you could only do one darn fact after another. And unfortunately, in speaking, I've shared those one facts after another, right? <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember anybody falling out the window, but we used to have a department chair named Paul Peterson that used to say, every true historian has to write one fiction book so they'll know you had a personality and that you were more. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, after all these nonfiction books, I actually teamed up with George Durant and we just published a fiction book, and it's my first, and I'll probably never do it again, you know, saying, you know, it's so much dribble, but it's very funny, and it's called Wesley and I for an Eye. That's my attempt to keep people from falling out of windows as I speak. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. They know you had a personality. (laughs) Yeah. Paul Peterson was uh, 
in my master's program, we were the first cohort of the Masters of Religious Education and really delightful, kind of kind of passed sooner than any of us wanted, but I, lo- I love that guy. <laughs> Me too. Paul now is pretty emotional. He's going to kind of begin bidding farewell. And obviously part of the various towns he's going to, he's saying goodbye, but the one account we get here in chapter 20 is he's bidding farewell to the friends he's had for so long in Ephesus where, and it's emotional on his part. And he talks about, I neither count on my life dear unto myself. He said, I just want to finish my course with joy. (laughs) I've got still got things to do. I want to be joyful about it. He testifies of the grace of God. He tries to remind them. It's kind of like he's giving his farewell almost a little bit, but he reminds them he's given a lot of faithful service, and now he wants the the leadership in Ephesus to feed the church. He even begins to quote words of the Savior that you can't even find in the four Gospels. So the one I liked is, it is more blessed to give than receive. Is coming here from Paul that he says the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in his departing, he becomes one of the first to talk about apostasy. And he says, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing, after I've said goodbye to all all of you, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And this is one of the first passages in the New Testament that foretells, hey, an apostasy is coming. And when he had had spoken, he kneeled down, he prayed with everyone. He said they all wept sore. They fell on Paul's neck. They kissed him because they realized they weren't going to see him anymore. And at this point, you get his third mission is now done. It's a beautiful farewell to read that. And I don't know, I think all of us may be on missions saying goodbye to people that you probably won't see again. It's really It's a beautiful part, I think, the end of Acts chapter 20. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when somebody leaves your house, it takes seven goodbyes to have them really go. (laughs) But in this case, you know, there are some goodbyes that are just heart-rendering because you know you won't see them again. And he's made such an incredible difference in their lives that they no longer are worshipers of idolatry, Diana, no longer rushing to the temple there of Artemis. And suddenly the man that's brought such amazing changes, blessings, uh, miracles to them is now leaving. But in that leaving is the warning, hey, behind me, follow the wolves. (laughs) And you church leaders, (laughs) just don't, don't go off thinking you're having just such a good time. You make sure that you watch over and you care for that flock. Look after the 99, but don't forget the one. It's interesting to me that they, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this when you're taking a child to the MTC or something, you have a family prayer with them. And I'm reading from verse 36 of Acts 20. When he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. And that's how it ends. I mean, that's walk with them down to the ship. and But they I love that they had a prayer to s- kind of say goodbye. Kind of a God be with you till we meet again type of moment. You know? Yeah. He says in verse 24, Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. He has dedicated his whole life to this. He says, For three years, in verse 31, I have not ceased to warn every one of you night and day with tears. Yeah, he has really given it all there in Macedonia. Yeah, that road to Damascus was quite an event, wasn't it, that just turned him. I think what I like is that although his mission is over, he knows the course of his life is not. And his plan is he wants to still have joy. I mean, there's incredible joy in sharing the gospel and seeing converts enter baptismal waters. But it's like the sacred ground he had gained on those three journeys on his mission. He wants to take it with him as he now returns to Jerusalem. And he wants to finish his life with joy. Not just where you say, 
endure to the end and blah, blah. <laughs> you know, you just kind of fall off. You're the back row, you know, of the church. He wants to finish it with that same sense of, I have this inward joy, inward peace that I've done my best. He really believes that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Ever since the road to Damascus, he's just given and given and given. And, and suffered prisons and, and, and gosh, what's coming in Acts 21? He's going to go to prison. Well, okay, for him, he's now taking off. It's going to be a seven-day journey. And he's being told, don't go back to Jerusalem. Who can tell you not to go back to the holy city? Yeah, right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> tell me not to go to Orem or something. I'm good. <laughs> you know, but wow. <laughs> uh, don't, don't go back to Jerusalem. <laughs> Along the way, he stops in Caesarea, which is pretty Roman looking. He enters the house of Philip, which is one of the seven. He abides with them. And while he's there, the prophet now comes and after he's been there a few days and the prophet does something pretty tangible. He takes Paul's girdle and he binds his own hands and feet and says, quote, thus saith the Holy Ghost, verse 11, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. In other words, Hey, Paul, I'm giving you like a little patriarchal blessing. <laughs> yeah, it's quite an object lesson, isn't yeah. it? Here's a heads up. I'm going to make it really visual so you're not just talking. I'm showing you this is what's going to happen to you if you keep heading up to Jerusalem. And I like Paul's answer, verse 13. What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only. In other words, you know, so they're going to bind me. So what? Have you seen what else has happened to me? <laughs> he goes, for I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem. And why am I willing to do this? For the name of the Lord Jesus. So you'd say, uh, does he have both feet in the water? Is he totally converted? And I go, oh, yeah, he is. And even a prophet foretelling what will come upon him does not stop him. And he heads up to Jerusalem. And when he gets into Jerusalem, he goes unto James and all the elders when they had saluted him. In other words, you know, welcome. And it's like he's going to tell you, well, let me tell you what I've been doing. <laughs> you know, I've been away for a while. You probably wondered if you heard about me. <laughs> yeah, gives a mission report. Mission report. Verse 19, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, notice their response. They glorified the Lord and saith unto him, Thou seest brother, and I like they called him brother. So of all the names of Paul, Saul, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. So if you were to say, well, what's the number of converts <laughs> that Paul brought into the church, although we can only name a few like Lydia, but he says, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe and they are all zealous of the law. In other words, they didn't just enter baptismal waters and then scoot out the door <laughs> and never yeah. to be heard of again. <laughs> they're still in and they're zealous. Paul then takes off after the report and he's heading to the temple. He's going to participate in purification rites because you realize for a Hebrew, a Jew, a tribe of Benjamin, you go out and you travel in Gentile lands you got to purify yourself. And for a Jewish person, I mean, that literally means you, you've got to go under the water. It's, the Jews didn't baptize Jews except for the purification. You got to go under water. It was very important that you be immersed because you couldn't have your hands sticking up because you would still have what might have polluted you in those Gentile lands. So he's in there participating in the sacred ordinance. And some of the Jews that had been in Asia and known of Paul, they see him in the temple. They stir up the people. They lay hands on him. And they're crying out, hey, everybody, come help me. You know, help me get him. And I'm talking about, what are you talking about? He's five feet tall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how many men do you need to help? <laughs> help me get this man. And remember, his, his words seem to be much bigger than a stature. They say, verse 28, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And the law in this place. 
and further brought Greeks also into the temple, in other words, perhaps as converts, and hath polluted this holy place. Well, they take Paul out, they draw him out of the temple, and they shut the doors of the, of the temple. And you're like, wait a minute, doors of the temple are open. <laughs> you know, It's not time to close them. Soldiers and Tyrians come, they, they bind him with chains. The chief captain demands to know, hey, what, what's going on here? And then by verse 37, Paul says, hey, can I speak to thee? And then the guy goes, well, canst thou speak Greek? And you go, well, hey, this guy seems to be, I mean, if you're looking for the intellect, the guy that was prepared to be a missionary and so many friends, he's like, oh, sure. And then verse 39, Paul said, I am a man which is a Jew of Tarsus. I'm a citizen of no mean city. <laughs> I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. He is given license to do so. Paul stands on the stairs. He now beckons the hand unto the people, you know, come unto me. There's a great silence. He's going to speak unto them in Hebrew. So basically what Paul has done, he's about to give his defense, but you're now left on a cliffhanger because you're going to find his defense in chapter 22, which will say to the listening audience, don't be left on a cliffhanger. Don't hesitate to read in advance for the next episode. <laughs> yeah. Keep reading. Wow. Paul going journey after journey, city after city, speech after speech. He feels tireless. I'm tired just reading it. He just does not stop. <laughs> the kid was fell out of the loft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting long-winded the older he gets, right? <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine this report when Paul goes in with James, all the elders that were present, verse 19, when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So he's going to tell them everything that happened in Athens. He's going to tell them everything that happened in Corinth and in Ephesus and their reaction. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord. I wish we could, you know, maybe someday we get to see all this stuff. I want to hear that mission report about how Paul reported to them and how excited they must have been to hear what the Lord was doing in these, what God has wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. I just think that, that was, those were fun verses to me to imagine. That's awesome. I like what, what, <laughs> how that is such a cliffhanger. Who decided to divide the chapter there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is and even funny. the come follow me lesson too. The come follow me lesson ends at 21. So it's so fun to see what Paul's able to do because of his background and education. And I'm just wondering, I'm looking at verse 37, canst thou speak Greek? How many languages do we think that Paul may have spoken? Uh, well, we know Greek for sure and Hebrew, right? But possibly Aramaic and Latin. Because he's, he's going to go to Rome. Yeah. <laughs> right. Multi-talented. Susan, you've done a, such a great job of walking us through these chapters in Acts. I know you're a church history expert as well. Does anybody stand out to you as, as a Paul-type missionary? Maybe there's nobody who has the type of impact Paul has as a missionary, but does anybody come to mind? Well, probably several. I mean, there was such excitement about they have a new message, the restoration, the gospel is restored. But the one who keeps the best journal account is Wilford Woodruff. 63 years, he keeps a journal. And at the end of each year, he did a summary page in which he would write down how many he had baptized, whether sea captains, whether kinsfolk. And at the end of 63 years, he's close to his death. And he asks that all his journals be brought to him. And he just tallies the summary page, much like you do an Excel spreadsheet. And he figures out how many talks he's given, you know, 7,555. And he just kind of goes, how many baptized? And finally, at the end, he announced, I made it. <laughs> and he mathematically announces, I made it. And then said that when he died, as people would come to the tabernacle, he didn't want anyone to wear black because uh, basically it was a celebration of, you know, a life that he had devoted to the Lord. Just a shout out to Wilford Woodruff. When I went to get a marriage recommend to marry Kim, 
I had to see her stake president. He was Tim's next door neighbor. His name is Wilford Bruce Woodruff. And that was so fun to go see President Woodruff and to see his full name there on the recommend and to feel like I was being interviewed by him. What a delightful person. And I asked him, do you have access to all those journals? Mm -hmm. He sure did wow. because he was a direct descendant. And remember when we used to do presidents of the church for Relief Society and priesthood meeting, he grew out his beard like Wilford Woodruff later in life and did presentations on that and came to our stake. It was just really fun. I wanted to shout out to President Woodruff for that <laughs> great funny. memory. <laughs> That's fantastic. So Susan, as I look back over these chapters, I see Paul in Macedonia. They convert Lydia, they get thrown in prison and end up converting the jailer. Then they go to Thessalonia where they teach and then Paul gets kicked out and he has to go to Athens. And in Athens, he gives this beautiful speech at Mars Hill. We are God's offspring. Then he's rejected by the Jews in Corinth. And he says, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not teaching Jews anymore. I'm going to the Gentiles. The Lord says, you know, calm down, hold not thy peace. Then he spends 18 months in Ephesus and converts and heals all sorts of people. Then he's back in Macedonia. I mean, this is just a, a, the guy's all over the place. And he heals the kid who fell asleep during his talk. And he finally finishes in Jerusalem where he is bound up. My hope for our listeners is that there's just a wow factor here of the guy was nonstop. He was nonstop. What do you think some major takeaways could be from these chapters? For me, you know, on that road to Damascus, he had a square one spiritual experience. And he just never forgot it. I mean, his theme was Christ wherever he went. And you'd say, you know, if you slow down on that theme, you might not be beaten. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you might not be yeah. put in prison. You might not have to escape at night. Through this, I think Paul knew who he was. He knew who his God was. He wasn't about to take a back seat. I really like that about him. I, th I think he was bold when some of us could be quiet, stutter, <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe. He didn't hesitate. And that is such a message. I mean, the most amazing thing, I mean, do you realize we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I mean, that's phenomenal. <laughs> and we're learning about the early Christians who uh, Paul never seemed to be, look at me, he was always pointing away to the Savior. And his message was the same. I see him as fearless. I think if I had been Luke and I could have chosen any missionary to write about, I mean, maybe Luke's up there saying, you know, I should have given Barnabas a second chance. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, with John Mark, I just know John Mark was going to stay with him and they were going to have this amazing mission. But Luke couldn't stop writing about Paul. But I think it's so interesting. He never writes about Paul's letters. He's none of that. He just wanted to do the biography of Paul as he did his travels. I don't know, as somebody that's been a serial missionary now, as I've gotten older, <laughs> Paul is just an example. You don't stop. You keep going. You, you still have a message, and you may not always have the forum in which to share it with the crowds and things like Paul wanted to speak to those, perhaps 24,000 there in Ephesus, but it wasn't the time. But you do have neighbors. I mean, you can be that number one Christian, <laughs> you know, to the people around you. And when the time is right to tell them about temples and covenants and prophets on the earth. I mean, it's a message that any other message we share just pales. Yeah. I think there's also something to be said for as you look at these chapters, there is going to be opposition. Almost everywhere he goes, he has success and then serious opposition. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. When you're going to do something good, <laughs> now you probably know you're on the right path when you're getting some opposition along the way. 
you know, it only comes in the ways that causes the greater pain, right? To be braced for it, to be able to accept it, and still remember who you are and the message you have to share. We spent some of the early parts of the book of Acts just going, wow, what a transformation Peter went through and the other apostles after the apostles at the end of the gospels seem suddenly just powerful and transformed. Invigorated, yeah. Yeah, at the beginning, and that's Paul's story too. And what was the big difference? The resurrected Christ appeared to them, changed everything for them, and that's all they wanted to talk about, as you just beautifully said. That's all they wanted to testify of, is that he lives again, and we saw him, and we're going to point you to Christ regardless of the opposition that comes at us. That's beautiful, both of you. One of my major takeaways is Acts 21, 13. For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That's an impressive verse. Sometimes we read through scripture and it's, it's black and white for us, right? But when you put flesh on that type of statement, the courage, and he does, he goes to Jerusalem and he is going to end up dying in the name of the Lord. It's so fun to see what Paul did. And then we have this whole nother way of looking at it, what Paul wrote to these different people. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he kind of gives this quick biography of himself. I'll start in verse 24 of 2 Corinthians 11. Of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Wow. So yeah, he's yeah. been through everything, but that last testimony, it's all, all that power he draws from that road to Damascus. Susan, I should call you Dr. Susan Easton Black. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have loved having you back. Yeah, we have just, we've loved having you. And John, the book of Acts to me has become more alive in the last few weeks than yeah. ever before. I'm really just loving these stories. I was familiar with them before, but now I feel like I'm really getting to know them. Yeah, and that's that's why I love this when he goes to report because you can just imagine the audience. Whoa, you did what? Oh, you said that, and that. Oh, wow, that's great. Then what happened? Well, I wanted to go in, and they wouldn't let me. Oh, how many? Oh, two hours. You can just imagine them listening and glorifying God the way they did, hearing his mission report. And that's why I, I want to see that one day and see not only what Paul says, but how they reacted when they're hearing this stuff for the first time. So yeah, Book of Acts is coming live. Yeah. The work rolls on. We want to thank again, Dr. Susan Eason Black for being with us. We want to thank our executive producer, Shannon Sorensen. We want to thank our sponsors, David and Verla Sorensen. And we always remember our founder, Steve Sorensen. We have one more lesson in the book of Acts coming up next week on Follow Him. Today's transcripts, show notes, and additional references are available on our website, followhim.co. That's followhim.co. You can watch the podcast on YouTube with additional videos on our Facebook and Instagram accounts. All of this is absolutely free, and we'd love for you to share it with your family and friends. We'd like to reach more of those who are searching for help with their Come Follow Me study. If you could subscribe to, rate, review, and comment on the podcast, that will make us easier to find. We've just completed a new project we think you'll love. If you would like short and powerful quotes and insights from all of our Old Testament episodes, join our mailing list on our website, followhim.co, and we will email you a PDF of the first three chapters of our new book, Finding Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. If you enjoyed our guests on the podcast last year as much as we did, we think you'll love this new collection. 